Well, my assignment tonight in this summer series that we've been in is to talk on the institution of marriage. And I, I think it's really important that we understand some things about marriage. And so as I talk about this, you may be sitting here tonight and going, well, I'm not married. Well, great, take notes, because maybe you will be. <laughs> and one day, if you'll get what I'm saying, your spouse will go, oh, thank you. Where'd you hear that at? Well, it was a long time ago. Uh, but for those of you that are married or been here a while in the institution of marriage, maybe there'll be some amens and some things that you go, yeah, I identify with that. And maybe if you've got some areas that you're struggling in and nobody may even know it, maybe God will answer some questions for you tonight. I think it's important that we understand some things about marriage. For one, marriage is the foundation a after God, but it's the foundation, the first institution in Scripture that God presents for mankind. And so I believe with all that I am that it is a foundation of peace being able to be in your home. I, I just believe that. It, it seems wherever we are, we're not seeing peace. Now, I, I don't know about you, but have you ever turned the news on and go, man, that just produced such peace for me? I mean, it's almost funny because no, you never see that and there's no peace in our world and sadly, many in the Christian realm don't even see peace. And I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not okay with God's people not living in something that God said we could have. So I, I want to have peace and when Christians have no peace, we've got a real problem in our world because I think that it needs to be in each and every home. So as I'm talking about it tonight... I want to start by saying God created a place of peace. And that peace was where man messed the whole thing up. And it was in the garden. In fact, when you look up the word Eden, which is the place where God created the institution of marriage, God created Adam and Eve in Eden. So marriage was created in Eden. Eden means pleasure and delight. That's what Eden means. <clears throat> And it was the most important ingredient in paradise, was peace. You can't be in pleasure and you can't be in delight when you're in turmoil. Peace is what allows that to happen. So I want you to know tonight, peace is the prize of marriage. Now let me go past marriage because in your home you have a lot of things after marriage. You have kids, you have in-laws. You have to deal with your own parents. You have to, there's so much, not just family, but then there's dealing with his job and her job. And there's just one thing after another that is going to affect life. And I'm telling you, that's when all things start going, ah! So you better have the marriage institution, right? And what I'm telling you is, if the marriage institution is where it needs to be, then you can handle everything else. For those that have lived long enough or, or been in a position where a spouse has been lost, I want you to know that you can reflect on the peace that God produced in your marriage. I'm not saying there wasn't issues at times, but everybody looks back and they don't look back at all the problems. They look back at the peace, the times that there was pleasure and there was delight because that's what God will use to grow everything else outside of where you're at. So I want you to know it's really important. Interesting statistic. People living with marriages that are in conflict live an average of four years shorter than those marriages which are not in conflict. Did you get that? If your marriage is in conflict, statistically speaking, you're going to live four years shorter than you would if you didn't have conflict in your marriage. And it also goes on to say that they have less diseases, less sickness, less things that are going on in their lives. So I, I, I just got four points tonight. I, I like points when I'm teaching, and Wednesday nights are just a great opportunity for that. Four foundations of true and lasting peace. Now, you can take these and you can use them in your home, you can use them in your marriage, or you can use them in any situation where you're finding turmoil, because when you have turmoil in any situation and peace is not there, you've got to have these things and you have to implement them so peace will take over in whatever you are in conflict or what area you're in frustration. So the number one thing tonight that I want to talk about of the four, number one is prior agreement is necessary. For you to have foundational 
peace, true and lasting peace, you have to have prior agreement. If you're going to have peace in marriage, you've got to have some areas that you've already agreed upon. Amos 3.3, can two walk together unless they agree? The answer is absolutely not. You can't. You won't walk with somebody you're not in agreement with. In fact, you'll try to do everything you can not to even have to get in front of them. So agreement is necessary for you to walk together. And if your home is going to be pastored correctly by you, then you need to know you got to work on getting people in agreement. And it's tough sometimes. I get that. But the longest journey you will have in most lives is marriage. If you're not in agreement, you're not going to end up in the same place. You're going to end up in conflict. And where there's no prior agreement, you've just got to always know conflict is there. I, I am still working on this. Uh, my wife's sitting on the front row, and I really want to encourage you to look at me tonight, not her. So it's very, very important. When we already know what restaurant we are going to, and everybody has agreed, there is peace in our car. Come on, you can apply this to anything. But I'm just telling you, if you don't know where you're going to eat, you can have World War III in your car because when you start pulling out, well, I'll just go here. Well, you know I don't like that. Well, then tell me where you want to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm certain that prior agreement would help in that situation. I'm telling you, when I remember it ahead of time, I start talking about it a day or two in advance. And when we make a decision on where we're going to go a day or two in advance, I'm telling you, Peace is there. And if somebody tries to change prior agreement, peace leaves. When you know what is allowed to be spent on what, preach that. You got to have a prior agreement before you go and start spending money or you're going to have a conflict. And money conflicts are a big issue. See, when i got to move past these so we don't get any divorces while I'm talking. When you know how much time a year you're going to spend with your in-laws or a month or a week, when you know what that is in advance, then you can be okay with going there. When it gets sprung on you at the last minute and you don't have prior agreement, you're like, okay, be careful about nodding your head here because some of y'all have family in here. We get married and we don't realize all the work it takes to be in prior agreement. Come on, everybody. We just don't realize it. We're just, we're young and we think that we're so in love and you don't understand how necessary prior agreement is. And so I, I am right now, I'm really preaching this message to a Bettinger boy. Because I'm just saving one of our times where we're going to get together and visit before y'all get married. And so if you'll take all the notes tonight, then that next session will be a little smaller. Prior agreement is important. So what, what we talk about prior to something happening will then be what your expectation is when that thing comes up. And when you haven't talked about it and that thing comes up and you're not in agreement, you've got to know there's going to be frustration. And you need to hear that tonight. I mean, just how many kids are you going to have? Uh, it's amazing how many people don't even talk about that until they've already got three. Really? Yeah. yeah. Is the wife going to work outside of the home or is she going to be a homemaker? It's a big question. Who will spend... Who, with, with whom will we spend the holidays? How does that all work? What is your thoughts? What, how about this? What church are we going to go to? Now, I'm saying this tonight because I know all of you have made the decision, obviously, to be here, but what about when one of you decides I'm not going to be anymore? Conflict. Or one of you says, I never wanted to go there in the first place. I've just put up with all your friends. See, I'm, you act like that doesn't happen. That happens in marriages because the enemy wants to split everything up that's in peace. He doesn't like peace because that's a God attribute. Who does what in the home? Who takes out the trash? Who washes the dishes? Who keeps the fuel in the vehicle? Who mows? Who disciplines the kids? 
Whose role is it to initiate intimacy? Who takes, I'm just on and on and on. You can just keep going and you're like, I, I got to tell you, I thought that the woman was supposed to take the trash out. And I, I know it's a really touchy subject. But I didn't realize it was ever the man's job. I thought it was the woman's job. Well, that was a frustrating thing in our marriage. And neither one of us would take the trash out. We just kept piling it up in the... I'm not even going there. You have to come to marriage retreat to hear the rest of the story. But it got ugly. And what I'm telling you is, is I didn't realize that she saw it different than I did. And I didn't realize how wrong she was. But I thought, finally, she'll figure it out. And when we got to the point of the conflict was so severe, we talked about it and found out the reason why we both thought the other one should do it, because we had grew up, and in my home, my mom always took out the trash, and in her home, her dad always took out the trash. See, just what you think is right based on what you've experienced growing up doesn't mean that that's going to be peaceful in your home. I'm just, and it's one thing after another. Which way you turn the toilet paper? It's over. We didn't have a problem there because we both agree with that. See, there's, there's just a lot in life that if you're not in prior agreement, you're going to be in trouble. Okay, well, let's, let's go on, not to number two. I want to talk about how to get in prior agreement because it's very important that you get some how-tos that you can make happen in your life. See, there's, there's three levels of communication in marriage. Three levels that you have to be able to communicate to establish prior agreement. Now, here's the problem. So many people don't understand these. The first one, and if you're taking notes, this would be A, under your first point, prior agreement. And so A would be proactive communication. That's a level of communication. That means we're going to communicate about things ahead of time. We have a budget. We live by a budget. Nobody spends money outside of the budget. We already know what that is. We're in prior agreement. So proactive means we talk about this before we go buy the new gun. We talk about this before we order all the Amazon Christmas presents in February. We talk about all of this, and we have a budget, and we know exactly where every dollar is going. Come on, amen, somebody. <laughs> you know? You know, that's, that's the thing that we, we are proactive in our communication and then we don't have money issues. Let's have a game plan. That's what being proactive is. It's being on the front end of things. One thing I learned years ago, if you can get on the front end of things in anything that you're leading or operating in and you're on the front end, then there's no surprises when you get in the middle of it. And nobody's frustrated on the backside. So proactive is your A. B, your second one here. The type of communication, that's a level that we can enter into, and it happens oftentimes after that, I'm so in love, dissipates, and then you got to choose love. It's called reactive. Reactive communication. Reactive communication takes peace out of your home. Reacting to kids, reacting to work, reacting to money and how it was spent. Reacting to intimacy or the lack thereof, reacting to spending time together or not spending time, reacting to how much hobbies you're still operating in. I mean, when we're not proactive and we've come to prior agreement on the front end, we're not proactive, then we are reactive. And we've got to understand that that's a level of communication after something happens and you react to it instead of you already knew what the action was going to be before you got there. Here's the third one, radioactive radioactive. This is where somebody's going to get hurt. It may not be physically, but somebody's going to be in a lot of pain. Things that when you communicate this, it's going to kill you. We've never agreed on this topic, so we both stay off of it because if it gets brought up, it's an explosion in our home. And, And everybody has these areas with people that you're really close to. If you're not careful, you'll find out that there are many things that if you bring up, it's going to cause a fight. Past situations, time spent with relatives, how we're spending money. And here's what you can know. Also situations where sin was involved. See, the, something happened that was sinful, and every time you bring it up, it just opens up the scar of the sin. The enemy loves that. 
just to keep bringing up somebody's past and things that should have been under the blood, and they are as far as Christ is concerned, but as far as you're concerned, it gives you an avenue to stab them. When things aren't going your way or you're not winning things, you bring up radioactive communication. Now, I want you to understand there are things that are radioactive that are not sin that still need to be talked about. Your spending habits. Now, if somebody said, Ugh, why did he just say that? Then I'm talking to you. Because spending habits cause a lot of problems. They really do. They cause a lot of problems. And I want you to know that you have to be able to talk about spending habits. And if you don't, then you're going to get yourself in a spending nightmare. And before long, you're years digging out of what you wouldn't communicate about. And so I think it's very important as I'm talking about this to understand that that can be an area that's radioactive. Now, you may go, it's not. So find out what those areas are. Who's responsible with what around the house? It, it can... Even be the way one remembers something that happened is different than the way another one remembers what happened. I remember it like this. Well, I remember it like this. Well, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Next thing you know, you're not talking for three weeks because of something that happened 30 years ago. When, when, when are we going? It wasn't a sin issue. They're just wrong because they keep communicating this like it didn't happen. And you keep communicating it the way it did happen. Well, that's all in your mind. They remember it different. It's a radioactive area, and every time it gets brought up, it's an explosion. What do we do? Radioactive topics are things that you can't bring up about the past. Again, sin issues need to be left alone because they're under the blood of Jesus. If Jesus says, I've put them into the deepest part of the sea, not to be remembered against you, if he says, I've separated them as far as the east is from the west, then why aren't you doing that if you've got the mind of Christ? Here's why, because you don't have the mind of Christ. We keep bringing up things. That's not Christ. It's under the blood. So I'm not talking about those right now. I'm talking about things that you do need to talk about. You have to have some prior agreement in areas that are radioactive. And I needed to spend some time here because I just realized I was praying about this. I believe that this is the area that will help somebody tonight. Because these are the areas that peace isn't allowed in the home on. But you need to talk about them. And so how do I talk about these? Well, we... We get into them and we just dive wholeheartedly all in and you pray your way in, you pray your way through, and you pray your way out. But you can't do it alone. You got to do it with your spouse. See, there are things that we're not ever going to see exactly the same, so we have to come to this word called compromise. And the areas that need to go under the blood, they're under the blood, not to be remembered. Let me say it like this, not to be brought up. Compromise means I want to spend $100. Well, I want to spend 200 okay? Compromise would be 150 right? The problem with that is at times we go, well, I want to spend 2000 when you only need 150 so you can get more than what you... You've got to be truthful in what you're doing to reach a compromise. And when truth is not present, then we have manipulation. And manipulation will lead to conflict. So I don't have time to get into this real deep, but let me just say this. Counseling oftentimes is seen as a sign of weakness, and it could just be a sign of wisdom. When you've got areas you can't bring up, you need to go to somebody who has fruit in that area or that you see and you both agree have that and sit down and present both sides. If you go, well, I'm not going to present my side to them. I'm not going to talk about that. Then you need to probably let the other person go ahead and have their way. Oh, really? Yeah. Because there is safety in a multitude of counsel. And when you can't get it based on just two people, let me say it like this. Teachable people succeed. So allow yourself to be taught unteachable people stay right where they are. Well, if you're in conflict and stay in there, then be unteachable or be willing to go somewhere. We had a lot of these areas in our life, and one of the things that finally happened, because we couldn't agree on anything, and you've heard me say it, we couldn't even agree on divorce, we decided to go sit down and listen, 
And I think the best thing, if, if counseling is necessary, it would only be necessary to get you to the place where you could go to a retreat and sit there and feed yourself, feed yourself. Yes, you can do that in one 30-minute sermon, but it's not enough for something that has took 20 or 30 years of resentment being built up. And so, well, there's just no peace when this thing comes up. All right, well, here's the deal. Let's get this thing going. <laughs> Well, I just don't think we can do it in one week. All right, well, you might have to spend three. You might have to spend four. You might have to be talking about this on a weekly basis. And we have a time where just the two of us, because we're not living in anxiety one second longer over this. And so we're going to have to get on the same page. When two people will surrender themselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ, then blessings and peace can come your way. But until you're both surrendered to the lordship of Jesus, then you're the Lord. And that's what keeps you from getting to an area of compromise in things that are not sinful. I don't want, there's no compromise on sin, okay? So don't hear that. I'm talking about in areas that we just can't see it the same. Who is taking out the trash? By the way, we got that fixed. I just want everybody to know. There's nothing wrong with both of you praying about something and then saying, okay, here's what I think. Here's what I think. But I want to give you some one, two, threes. Or not, I'm not really one, two, threes. Just some things to think about. Be careful about saying, I've prayed about this and God told me that this is the way it is. Because somebody else could come back, the other spouse could come back and say, well, I prayed about it and I think this is the way it is. And then you're holding God responsible for the other's decision and it's just an opinion. And so I always want you to be careful about pulling the God card. What you do is you pray about things together and you be very careful. Here's what I feel. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I think from Scripture I'm seeing. And, and let me just tell you why I think what I think based on what I see Scripture revealing to me. But I want you to know I may have it wrong. Do you see how you can say that is a lot softer than coming in and saying, I just want you to know I prayed about it, and God said this is the way it is. I have had marriages that I have tried to counsel through that, and I'm telling you, they may have been right, but their attitude was wrong. And the next thing you know, we've got a split in marriage. Be careful. Just be careful. Talk and pray until you both have a peace about your future. And I'll give you a quick example. Michelle and I being called into ministry, I knew that that was going to be a tough decision. And so we just both prayed and we both prayed and we sought the Lord and God help us to know what to do here on what you're calling us to do. And when we finally sat down and talked about it, we were in exact agreement. But all of the agreement prior to that had been we would never be in ministry. Because we'd seen what it did to people's lives and to people's marriages. And we're like, no, not going into ministry. But God said, wait, I'm first. And when we surrendered to his lordship, he brought us both into exact communication on it. So if you've got an area that you're not there, keep praying. Keep praying. Colossians 3.15. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. Here's what you got to know. We always take that verse and we just use it as the body of Christ. But I'm talking about the body of the home. Because Christ is seen through what's going on in the home. And in the home, we need to have peace. Therefore, you can take that scripture and apply it immediately. If Christ will rule in the heart of man and the heart of woman then I'm telling you, you can have peace. But that's the only way it'll happen. When you get peace from God, I'm telling you, you can have a future together and you can walk a path together and you can end up at the same destination. And that is important for God's people. You proactively agreed on something, you write it down, you have something to hold you accountable, you prayed, you heard from God. When you start reacting, if you're not careful, you're reacting and continue to react about something, move something into radioactive. Did you get that? Prior agreement, being proactive is so important, so important. Number one part of peace is our communication, and that has to have prior agreement. Number two, number two, keep God's purpose for your marriage a priority. Have a vision. Keep God's purpose a priority. Rick Warren, 
purpose-driven life. I don't really, I don't know if any of you have ever heard that, but that was a, a book I did years ago and went through. And one of the things that I loved that he said, the first sentence is, it's not about you. And I was like, what do you mean? I remember reading that the first time going, yes, it is. Jesus died for me. What he's saying is, is you'll never grow past salvation without understanding after salvation, it's not about you, it's about him. And so if you don't have God's purpose for your marriage, the priority, then you'll have your purpose. And you got to be careful here. Many people get caught up on the day-to-day life and only see what they're doing from a very small viewpoint. They don't get a big picture. Marriage affects so many people. And know this, if you don't have prior agreement and you don't have God's perspective on why you're married, then you won't be able to model that marriage for your own children. You won't be able to model it for those that are in your circle of life. And we need some marriages that are models. And you will never have that as a model until you get to a place where you see it's not about you, it's about God. Understanding that God's call on your life now is no longer separate, it's together. It's together. The bigger story of your life is that you're more effective together than apart. And you say, "Uh uh-uh, and I'm saying, "Uh uh-huh. Why am I saying, "Uh uh-huh? Because you became one flesh. And if you're not operating as one flesh, then you're not operating with God's call on your life. And therefore, it's like trying to split flesh. And if you ever try to split flesh, I'm just telling you, it's probably painful. So we don't want to split flesh. We want to keep it together and operating together and looking like it's a good flesh. If something doesn't look good on your flesh, you have a concern. If something doesn't look good on your marriage, you're not looking right and you're not being effective for the big purpose of the kingdom of God. What is the purpose of you being married? Well, there's a whole lot to it. For years, I thought the purpose was for her just to support me in everything I chose to do. And I, if she wasn't, then I was always mad and blaming her. I don't like talking about this because it's kind of embarrassing. I wasn't a good husband and I wasn't a good dad. And if I spend too much time, I'll start blubbering. I was gone all the time. My heart had the wrong priorities. I was building a business, and I was seeing success in every part of my life except for in my marriage. I was damaging my wife, I was damaging my children, and I was on the brink of divorce before all of a sudden God had my attention. And Psalms 127.1, which has already been mentioned in this summer series, but unless the Lord's building the house, then you're laboring in vain. You're not doing anything. And so I, I thought with all of my counseling training, if she just listened to all my counseling, she'd be fine. But she wouldn't listen to anything I was saying and vice versa. I wasn't listening to anything she was saying. And so before long, we were just growing and growing apart and we weren't even walking the same path. I want you to know that your day-to-day life is very significant in the big picture. Very significant. Getting up every day and making God a priority in your life and in your marriage. It's important. Making, it, making an eternal difference in your kids' lives, in those that you do life with, in your church. I just I, I now get up daily, and I, I remember this, and I think it's one of the reasons why God doesn't allow us sometimes to forget things. I remember the jerk I was. And therefore, I move forward going, God, thank you for saving me from the jerk man I was. Thank you that I've got a new hope and a new future in you, and that I can make up for lost time. And so I thank God that he gave me a wife who actually did what Jesus did for me, and she redeemed me back to herself. Jesus knew what I had done. He knew all of my mess-ups, and he redeemed. He made a way for me. And then he calls the church, the bride, and him the groom. Well, how can we be the church? Because he redeemed us back in all of our mess-ups. And still loved us and brought us in. I have to daily say, God, thank you that I got a wife who did that for me. And I pray that in all of her areas that I have done that for her. See, you get up daily being effective for the kingdom. And you resemble the relationship between Christ. Anybody getting this tonight? It's just deep. So, I didn't know 
that God had called us at the time I was going through all these marriage problems into doing ministry here at CMC. I didn't know that. I just knew this. I was going to have to start working on my marriage, and it was going to be a continual work forever for the rest of my life. And I still live there. And I'm, I'm still going to get it the best I can. And you got to know, we still occasionally do things and say things and can't pick a restaurant. I knew there were times that we needed to raise godly children. And when those times were, were all the time. And so more than anything, we wanted our kids to love God. That's our heart. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to witness God's love to reach others for Christ. We wanted other people to be saved. We wanted other people to know what God had done for us. And I then wanted him to know what he'd done in my marriage. And so we each get up daily knowing God has a bigger purpose than my attitude right now. So I better get the attitude in line with what my purpose is. Are, are you hearing this? And I better get my attitude in line with what God has in store for where we're going and what we're doing. And if I'm not careful, then what I'll do is I'll get caught up on the frustrations I'm dealing with right now. But when I realize there's a bigger purpose, I get, get twisted back where I needed to be because I was twisting off. And everybody's been there, and you've got to know there's a big, big purpose in what God has for your marriage Make your marriage a priority. Number three, partnership. Having a partnership produces peace. Marriage is about sharing. And it's about equal partnership. Dominance destroys marriage. Your spouse should be able to say anything they need to say without paying a price. Now, now that I said that, that's one side. They should be able to say anything without paying a price. So you should never say something to someone else that would cause you to pay a price. Are, are you hearing me? So there's two sides of that coin. So you should be able to say anything, but don't be willing to go talk to a total stranger kinder than you would your spouse. Make sure that you're not saying anything and making them be in a position where you don't have to pay a price for what you just said. But then also be the spouse who is willing to listen and understand that I... I'm not going to keep them from saying something to me and make them pay a price for what they say. Your spouse should be able to say it. Be kind, be polite, give a spouse the right. Say it like this. Let me just say it like this. We're equal stockholders in this marriage. Now, in relationships where there is dominance, dominance, one person owns more stock than the other. Come on, that'll speak to somebody. You'll hear what I'm talking about there. Unequal partnership. One person makes a decision without consulting the other person. One person feels feel fearful or less significant in the decisions. I want to say once again, this was me. I didn't take Michelle into consideration. When she said something I didn't like, she going to hear about it. That's the way I was. And she had a price to pay. When she did something I didn't like, she had a price to pay. And so I, 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 I want to ask you tonight, don't raise your hand, how many were raised in a home where one of the parents were dominant. Now, think about that. Raising a home where dominance was on one side. Now I'm going to ask you this. How many would say now that that was you that were raised in that home, that same thing has caused problems in your own marriage? See, we think it's okay to have unequal stock. And we can't. Dominance causes problems in your marriage, and it's a real key tool that the enemy uses to keep frustration there. Michelle and I do everything we can to make decisions together. And I, I, I'll say this, and I'm saying it with her sitting on the front row. I don't bully. I don't bash her for a bad decision, and she doesn't do that to me either. Now, I'm not saying I'm just thrilled when she makes one, and I promise you she's not. But we walk away from decisions and we don't pout and we don't live like we're five years old frustrated that we couldn't do what we wanted to do. We've got to get our marriages to that place. Michelle has kept me from making some really bad decisions. And know this, I've kept her from just as many. That's equal partnership. Each person will keep the other from making bad decisions Marriage is about sharing. We share. We share ministry. We share our home. We share our life. We share our children. We're not existing by me having my life and her having her life. 
Partnership brings a sense of peace. That's not saying she can't go shopping and I have to do that with her. If she's going to go with me, we have to have a list of what we're buying and we, we're, it's a game how quick we can get it done. But that doesn't mean she has to go golfing and do things with me that she doesn't want to. However, you can't have a whole life of doing everything separate. So we also have had to work on finding the things that we can do together. And so it's very, very important to understand what marriage is about. And partnership brings a sense of peace. Uh, it just it brings a knowing that God has a plan. Okay, the last point, number four, is prayer. Guard your hearts and minds. Be a person of prayer. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Many, many worriers in this life. Let me say it like many worriers in church. There's a lot of worriers in church. Anxiety and worry. Lots of it there. Know this. Both of those are choices. You choose worry and you choose anxiety. Anytime you find yourself making that choice, you can know that you can't blame anybody else for where you're at. So you got to guard your intellect and you have to guard your emotions. Anxiety and stress are a number one killer in marriage. And the only thing that will remove them is a relationship with Jesus. It's not getting them to do what you want them to do. It's a relationship with Jesus and getting his peace to come into your life. If you don't pray, you can write this down, you're going to worry. If you don't pray, you're going to have anxiety. So if you're living worried, and I have been there, I have lived in anxiety, and I have been there, I will find a place, and I'll just go start praying in the Spirit all by myself, and I'll build myself up, and I'll do everything I can to not let worry and not let fear take me. Matthew 18, 19. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. If you don't pray, then you're not getting God's hand into the situation. The effectual fervent prayer of one in right standing does great and mighty things. It prevaileth in the King James much. It works. It works. It works. And here's what I can tell you. When you have a husband and wife praying about the same thing in agreement, you got to know that reaches the hem of his garment because it's one flesh operating wherever they are. I love it when I'm not with her and we talk about, let's be praying about this, and we get back. And when we get back together, it's like, whoa, we can take on the gates of hell. How does that happen? Because agreement produces results. So get kingdom agreement, and the way you get kingdom agreement is prayer. Do you get these? Number four, the four foundations. Number four, prayer. Number three, keep your spouse, your partner. Don't make another partner in life. Make your spouse your partner. The second thing, have God's purpose for your marriage a priority. And the first one we spent a lot of time on, get in some prior agreement. If you're not there, work on it. Hope you got some things to work on tonight. I hope that was edification for some of you. And I hope that some of you that aren't even married yet go, man, I think I could do this. Y'all stand with me this evening.